that we have here at Calvary Church. And I pray for Joey that be able to speak through him and that we can really listen to his word and hear what he has to say and his name is. Amen. Woo! Yeah, middle school, you guys are out of here. Yeah, but it's a You're it's a tough thing. All right. You guys want to change seats? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Woo. My name is Joey. Hi, Joey. And, uh, <laughs> it is my pleasure and my honor to uh, speak to you guys today. Um, a couple weeks ago, I. Uh, met with an old friend of mine who is honestly probably my oldest friend. He, uh, I moved uh, from Cupertino when I was uh, 11 years old. So anyone before that, I never kept in touch with. And uh, yeah, so the only friends I have, the oldest ones are from right after that. And uh, seventh, eighth grade, I didn't really play sports much. I grew a lot, so I'm trying to figure out my body and couldn't really run around very well. Uh, so, uh, like a lot of guys do when they can't, <coughs> well, that's not true. But uh, when they don't play sports, they uh, join Boy Scouts. So I, uh, I became Boy Scouts. Well, I did not mean to throw that much shade on Boy Scouts. I was one, okay? Um, I joined Boy Scouts when I was uh, seventh grade. And uh, so I'm like 12 years old, and I joined, and I really wasn't that great at it, I'm gonna be honest. I joined because I wanted a sense of community. <sighs> Though, uh, as we know, uh, when you turn 18, you are no longer a Boy Scout, and you gotta get out of there. You can't pursue um, this legendary Eagle Scout, and you're done, that's it. And your community is now gone, toast. I think what I was looking for at 12 was a church. Because um, you guys, even after you guys leave high school ministry, you can come back the very next Sunday and you still have a community. Now back to Boy Scouts, I was not that good. I think in two years I uh, ranked up once, which all I have to do is like read some paragraph and you know, like the next rank, tenderfoot, and uh, maybe two merit badges. Um, yeah, that's really it. Uh, but, and once I got to high school, I uh, started playing sports and I left uh, Boy Scouts behind. But, but, uh, I met a guy who's now one of my closest friends. Uh, this, this friend who even through high school, he was a couple of years older than me, he remained a friend of mine even when I stopped doing Boy Scouts. And over the years, we progressed from Boy Scouts to being involved in uh, sports, talking about that. Um, to, to cars, to all these different interests that we've shared. And what was most fun was when I was 14, I'd go over to his house, he lives right by that 7-Eleven in Los Gatos near the high school. And we would just play video games and go down and get Slurpees, and I loved hanging out with this friend. And uh, recently though, a week ago, he told me that, um, he said, hey Joey, uh, my dad, Last, he found out three weeks ago that he is, has stage four cancer and he's probably gonna die within six months to a year. And uh, he can try chemotherapy. He tried the strongest chemotherapy, but after one session he said, I'm not doing that anymore. That was too much. 
<clears throat> now that's terrible. This, uh, my friend's father was also the scout master, so the pseudo pastor, like a church, <laughs> um, scout master of the troop. Great guy. Though, my friend told me that he's putting everything in his life in order. And he's making sure that everything is set up for when he dies. So he's got a house, so he's making sure he can sell the house. He's got a car, so what are they going to do with the car? He's got a motorcycle he's had for 20 years. So who's that going to go to? Is he going to sell that? A will, um, everything that he has to pay, all of that. He's making sure he's setting up everything. He's built a company for 25 years. He started from the ground, and now he owns it. It's successful. But now he's passing it on to someone else. And he's making sure to everything and every aspect that he is set up and everybody else is set up for uh, when he passes away. He's a pretty good outlook. But let me tell you something. He's not setting up what matters. He's not setting up what matters because he's not focused on his eternity with God whether he likes it or wants to accept that or not. It's not believe in Jesus Christ. And although he's setting up all these things, he really isn't setting up what's important at all. And that's it's very unfortunate. I asked a friend of mine who just overcame cancer, praise God, that she could not imagine going through cancer without prayer. She couldn't imagine. She said, that is impossible. How would I go through cancer without prayer? So I can't imagine what my friend's father is going through. And little does he know what lies in store. Guys, today I want to talk about something that is so foundational in my Christian walk. This is so important to understanding what separates this church, this faith, from all other religions, other supposed gods, every other way you could spend your time in a religious state. I want to show you what separates us, very, make it very, very clear. And how I'm going to do that is through some selected verses out of the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah is in the Old Testament. Isaiah is a prophet. A prophet is someone that spoke to God and God spoke through through the scriptures. Now Isaiah gives a beautiful, wonderful, prophetic word about the coming of Jesus, which wouldn't happen for hundreds of years. The Jews were waiting, and they saw through Isaiah that, hey, something's going to come. And that ended up being Jesus Christ. Isaiah didn't get to see that come to fruition, um, but I think he made something very clear. Guys, we, I want to make sure before I get into this that I know you just got, a lot of you came back from Hume Lake, and you understand what the gospel is, and you know what it is, you're like, all right, I'm in. <clears throat> but we need to hear the gospel every single day because we forget it every single day. Amen, Tyler? <laughs> Every day we forget it. So I want you to grasp on today, and I want to make you remember what our gospel is. Just for today, and then tomorrow you soak yourself in the word, because I will not forget tomorrow. All right. So, here's what I want to share with you guys. What actually matters? Isaiah 40. It's like the beginning of the second part of this book where he starts talking about the prophecy of Jesus Christ. All men are like grass. All their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall. But the word of our God stands forever. The word of our God stands forever. So 
So what is he saying? All men are like grass. All you guys, I'm sorry to say it, but we're all like grass. Here's what I mean. You guys ever see a large field, all like beautiful grass? Well, one day that's all going to turn to dust. All that grass is going to die. It will be non-existent. We will wither. Moving on to chapter 40, that was verse 6 through 8. This is 19. As for an idol, a craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it. But what is it? We can look at a suit of armor. People spend 500 hours. They overlay everything, every little piece. It's perfect. The longest lasting suit of armor. But what's going to happen? That will turn to dust. No matter how much work you put into it in this world. My friend's father, his company, he spent 25 years. It'll probably last maybe another 20 years. And then guess what? It's going to turn to dust. Nobody will remember it. Next thing you know, 100 years later, that company might as well not have existed. His motorcycle, which he loves, that's going to fall apart one day. It'll turn to dust. But what stands forever? Our God. The Word. We could read the beginning of John. The beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. He stands forever. That's it. He's putting his will in order and where his house goes and his motorcycle. But what about what stands forever? What about that? So moving on, here's what I want to say to you guys. What makes us unique from every other faith? In Islam, any other religion, here's what separates it. Okay, number one. We call on God. God works for us. He rescues us. He saves us. We call on God. God works for us. And then we glorify him. Boom. That's Christianity. Every single other religion in the world They work for God. They can spend their whole life, they can, they, can, they can climb the mountain. They can pray eight times a day on their knees. They can follow every single commandment of their text. But how do they know? They have to, they have to do everything they can and work their whole lives just hoping that their God approves of them when they die having no relationship with that God that they're working for. How terrible is that? Every single other deity, other God, you work for him. But we call on God. We call on him. And he works for us. And he rescues us. And he saves us out of whatever pit we're in. And he works for us through us. How beautiful is that? How beautiful is that that he works through us as well? And then all he's asking, all he's asking is for us to glorify him. Let's find some evidence of this, alright? Alright. I'm going to go back to Isaiah 6 where we call on God. But before that, I want to go to Isaiah 46. 46.4. 46, Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. He works for us. He rescues us. He will save us. He. Isaiah 64. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. God works for those who wait for him. We call on him, he works for us, and we glorify him. 
We glorify Him in the waiting. And no matter what happens, we glorify God anyway, and we sing praises to this God. That's all He's asking for. Now, I think a lot of you guys, maybe you just got back from Hume Lake or the summer was great and you went to Tahoe or something. You're like, wow, nature, that was great. I'm totally in. I understand the gospel. I understand that I am a sinner. And out of love, out of deep love, God sent his son so that we could live. Boom, I accept it, I love it, I'm saved. But here's what I hear. You know what, Joey? <clears throat> it's been like a month, and I don't think God has called me to do anything. You know, it's been a year, it's been two years. Joey, you know, really my whole life, God hasn't called me to do anything. You know, he hasn't come down and said, hey, I want you to... Uh, you know, do this great thing. I want you to go to this certain place. I want you to stand here and I want you to say this certain thing. He hasn't done that to me, so um, that's it. Let me tell you something. God does not need you. He doesn't need you at all. He's God. Anything he wants to do, he could do. Anything. Do you think he needed you? To create the heavens and the earth? I don't think so. I don't think I'd be very much help. He doesn't need us, but let me tell you something. He wants you. He wants you so bad. And he loves you. <clears throat> Isaiah 6, where we're going to see that we call on God, and then he works for us. And then we glorify him. Isaiah 6. You know, I have a problem with Isaiah 6. I'm going to be honest. In my Bible, the, uh, the title, the like little summary title of the chapter is <clears throat> The Calling of the Prophet Isaiah or Isaiah's Commission. Now, that's just not true. Isaiah wasn't called. He volunteered. He volunteered. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for me? And I said, Here I am. Send me. Send me, God. There is a broken and sick and depraved world that is dying. Send me, God. Use me. Please use me, God. I I'm tired. I. I I see so much brokenness. I see so many people setting up their wills. But not, not even talking to you for a second, God. Use me. Use me, God. He called on God. Use me. And what did he do? 